Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Steve Donovan, the Director of Alumni Relations at Trinity College. Thanks so much for joining us along the virtual long walk on a hopefully a beautiful summer evening, wherever you are. We hope that your summers are going well, albeit too quickly, I'm sure. We're especially excited to bring you tonight's installment of the Trinity Authors Series, as it brings us not just one incredibly accomplished author, but two, a twofer, if you will. And a number of you have also joined us tonight because of a legendary faculty member who was more than willing to let us impede on her summer vacation with family tonight to be with this power couple. So many Trinity alumni cite the incredible bonds they have with faculty members as a defining and enduring hallmark of a Trinity education. And tonight we'll get to witness firsthand a special example of that. Let me introduce our moderator tonight. Mila Cozart Riggio, the James J. Goodwin Professor of English, received her PhD from Harvard University. Since 1995, she has focused on Trinidad Carnival and culture. She has edited dozens of books and written articles on Trinidad Carnival and its culture. I, I, she, I, I loved her read them all, but she's not gonna let me. So I'll just say dozens of books and written articles, um, as well as uh, on the festival of Jose in Cedros and Port of Spain, Trinidad, and Hindu Ramlila performances in Trinidad. For 20 years, she coordinated the Trinity and Trinidad Student Exchange Program and has served as a consultant to the National Carnival Commission of Trinidad and Tobago, with whom she organized three international carnival conferences, receiving a cabinet level appointment to the organizing committee for the 1999 conference in Port of Spain. She delivered a plenary address at the Leeds, England International Calypso Conference in 2005 and another at Power Performance and Play, uh, May 2017, a conference commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Leeds West Indian Carnival. She delivered a distinguished open lecture at the University of the West Indies, 214. She is a charter member of the board of the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics, for which she co-directed a festival work group in Chile in the summer of 2016. Her grants and awards include a Fulbright Fellowship to study in Australia, a Carnegie Mellon Award for graduate study at Harvard, a year-long NEH grant to study Trinidad Carnival, both of Trinity College's Senior Teaching and Achievement Awards, and awards from the city of Hartford for her contributions to the West Indian communities of the city. She's a Trinity legend, and it is indeed my pleasure to turn the program over to her. Thank you, Noah. Steve. Thank you very much, and thank you for that Trinidad focused introduction of me. I think most of my students will remember my interest in Shakespeare, which I have taught at Trinity for about 45 years. We thank you for organizing this virtual series, including the June 30th program entitled When in Rome. And welcome to our audience, which includes some familiar names, I must tell you. We look forward to taking some of your questions later. You please put those in the Q&A function of this uh, Zoom meeting that you're on, and we will moderate the, a few of those as with time permits at the end. Okay, we'll have that clear. Today, talking to two of my ex-students and lifelong friends who also happen to be distinguished Trinity graduates, James, but I'm gonna call him Jim, Longenbach and Joanna Scott, a husband and wife team who are both acclaimed, well-published and highly honored writers and professors, as well as the parents of two daughters. We will actually begin by returning to Rome, which you see behind me here as a virtual screen, where Jim and Joanna met each other for the first time as both studied with me in the spring of 1981. Our group in Rome that spring was a special one, a little apart from the campus as a whole, as I had recruited my very own personal and private 12 students at Trinity to study with me at the Rome campus. I taught these 12 students three of their four courses, all of their courses but Italian, which of course I couldn't teach, and took them on walking tours of Rome each week, which as I was new to Rome myself, I had walked through just the day before. We were a close group, and as I introduce them, I want to share a couple of anecdotes about Jim and Joanna in Rome. So to begin their introductions alphabetically, James Longenbach is the author of six books of poetry, most recently forever, W.W. W. Norton, 2021, and nine books of literary criticism, most recently, The Lyric Now, University of Chicago Press, 2020. His poems and essays have appeared in the New Republic, the New York Times, and the New Yorker. 
He has taught, get ready for this, at Breadloaf, Oxford University, Princeton University, where he got his PhD, and if memory serves me correctly, turned down a full-time position to stay at Rochester, the Warren Wilson MFA program, and he is now the Joseph Gilmore Professor of English at the University of Rochester. The recipient of awards from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the Mellon Foundation, <coughs> He had received his PhD from Princeton after graduating from Trinity in 1981, where he spent his last semester studying in Rome with me, just about the location you see behind me. That is where he met Joanna and their life story together begins. But going to Rome was not easy for Jim. First of all, graduating seniors are not allowed to study abroad at Trinity. So Jim, who was already a student of mine had to petition just to go with me to Rome. Also, as a poet, Jim was one of just four poets who had been chosen to participate in the Connecticut undergraduate poetry circuit that spring. His poetry advisor, Professor Hugh Ogden, wanted him to go on that circuit, which was an honor for Trinity as well as Jim, and then to come to Rome late. But in typical fashion, Jim said, no. When you are doing something, you need to concentrate on doing that well. So he gave up the circuit to go to Rome without so far as I know, even looking back. Since he is now a well-published poet, obviously he did not lose his touch. Beyond that, as an accomplished pianist, who I believe had once thought of becoming a professional pianist, you can nod if that is correct, Jim. Jim was used to practicing music five or six hours a day. He had been promised a piano, which it took a few weeks actually to procure for him in his room. In the meantime, and I don't know whether he remembers this or not, but I do, he sat on his bed in the convent where our students live, practicing an air piano on his lap for hours each day. Such was the discipline that has served him well throughout his lifetime. And last in this little litany of things, he was writing a book of poems rather than a thesis for his senior English honors project. We did not have remote teaching back in 1981. So in Rome, I would have to direct that project. Now, though I taught poetry, I had never taught poetry writing and I had no idea how to do that. I didn't, did know how to read poetry and to comment on it as a reader, but not in a classroom. I refused to do this in a classroom, which I thought might've been a bit of a desecration. So I arranged with Jim that we would meet in a different Roman cafe each week. I would read and comment on his poetry as we enjoyed wonderful Roman bistro and cafe fair. That worked like a charm, creating some of my best Roman memories. I hope you remember that, Jim. However, I must add that this being the semester that Jim met Joanna, as the semester progressed, these poems were increasingly about a girl with green eyes in a hooded coat. Jim, I still hope you still have a copy of those poems. I don't think I ever had one, and I would love to read them again, as I've enjoyed reading your later, possibly more mature poetry, <laughs> most recently forever. And now to turn to that girl whose green eyes uh, with green eyes, who once upon time wore a hooded coat in Rome. I want to introduce to you Joanna Scott. Uh, Joanna graduated with honors from Trinity a year after Jim in 1982, before continuing on to receive an MFA from Brown University, along with another Trinity graduate who I believe is attending tonight's event the novelist and professor Jim Shepard, who also went to Brown, though not, I think, simultaneously with Joanna. <clears throat> Joanna is the author of a baker's dozen 13 works of fiction. Her awards include a MacArthur Genius Fellowship that she amazingly won. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Joanna, but I believe it was at the age of 29, unbelievably. The Rosenthal Family Foundation Award, a Lannan Literary Award, a Magdalene Foundation Award, and like Jim, the best of them all, a Guggenheim Fellowship. Well, maybe not better than the MacArthur. Her first novel, Fading My Parmachine Bell, was not easy for Joanna to write, or I should say to start writing, because once she started it, she wrote it very quickly in a matter of a few weeks, as I recall, and she has never looked back. A Parmachine Bell is, I believe, a fishing lure. And this novel was in fact influenced by her father who I believe loved fishing. Also, of course, by her writing teacher, Thalia Seltz, whose office was exactly next to mine at Trinity. 
and even more, as Thalia pointed out to me, by Shakespeare's King Lear, which Joanna had studied with me, a conglomerate set of sources for a beautiful novel. Her novel, The Mannequin, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and her stories have been selected for Pushcart Prize anthologies and Best American Stories. Her new collection of stories, excuse me while I disappear, was published by Little Brown in April 2020. I'm hoping we'll talk about a couple of those later. A book of interviews, Conversations with Joanna Scott, has recently been edited by Michael Lackey and published by the University of Mississippi Press in 2017. She and her husband, Jim, were fellows at the James Merrill House in 2019. Joanna is the Roswell Smith Burroughs Professor at Rochester. <laughs> in 2009, Joanna was asked to deliver the Trinity graduation address in honor of the 50th anniversary of women at Trinity, both faculty and students, from which she received an honorary degree that year. So he has one of the few Trinity PhDs honorary. I was her escort on that occasion, which we jointly enjoyed perhaps a bit more than we should have sitting together on the graduation <laughs> stage, from which Joanna delivered a graduation speech more memorable, I trust, than our schoolgirl giggles on that stage. Joanna also studied with me in Rome in the spring of 1981, but unlike Jim, I met Joanna for the first time in Rome. One small Joanna story <laughs> from that term that I think may help to characterize her. Unlike Jim, Joanna was a junior that spring. Now, Trinity gives a sizable financial prize each spring to the student that the department chair believes to be our top junior major. In 1981, the then chair of the department had decided instead of just choosing the best student to ask each competing junior to write a five page essay. Joanna was eligible, though at that point, she was not yet as highly prized by the department as she would become. She had flown just a little under her, the radar. But I saw how unusual a student she was, so I petitioned to let her send an essay back to the US before instant cyber transmission. The department agreed. This meant not only to let her send her essay, but to delay the prize until it could be received. That was quite a, a gesture because it meant waiting a few weeks for the mail. Remember those days when we got mail? Joanna wrote her essay, as I recall, on the Italian poet Petrarch, I hope that's right, Joanna, whom we were studying in one of my Rome courses. She turned in a draft to me, which an unfortunately typical fashion I covered with my own corrective ink, <laughs> making myriad suggestions for what I assumed would be improvements. Joanna took this red lined document back to her room and the following day emerged with a new essay, ignoring all of my suggestions. <laughs> Beginning, in fact, with just two words that are etched in my memory, quote, wide water. Words that applied both to Petrarch and to Joanna now in Rome, far from the US. It was not at all the essay I had told her she should write. It was much better. It was brilliant. She won the prize. And I learned an important lesson about how to teach Joanna Scott. <laughs> Now with this as background, I would like to ask Jim and Joanna jointly to talk about their uses, of, uh, about, talk about that experience in Rome, um, their meeting, how they got together after that and on the lives and literary and professional careers they have built on this base. They may choose between them when and how to speak. Jim okay. and Joanna. Well, thank you so much, Mila. Um, I think a lot of people here in, in our virtual room are um, your former students, and we all are so grateful to you. We Our, our uh, lives were transformed by our encounters with you. Uh, you shaped us. You sent us on our way. Um, luckily, with that essay, which did include uh, 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 comments on Wallace Stevens as well, that I, I didn't know I'd won. Um, and then I was uh, I stayed on as, in Rome for as long as I could until my money ran out. And I had about, I don't know, 12,000 lira. And uh, I was camping out and uh, <laughs> on couches and 
places and uh, yeah, actually, <laughs> we won't say. <laughs> we won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I didn't even have a plane ticket home. I didn't know I, I was I was going to get home. And then suddenly Trinity, you know, came to me with with uh, a, a gift to at least help me get home. So that was wonderful. And that, that I, in fact, it was a lot of your guidance that I uh, steered me in that direction. And I just wanted to share with, with people, I actually have Mila, my old Rome journal. <laughs> and I, it's what amazes me when I look back on it is, is you can see if I, I don't know if people, it's kind of hard to see it, but you can see that's my handwriting. And that's Mila's. She almost wrote as much as I did in this. Uh, your, your comments were so thoughtful, so uh, so engaged with my ramblings. And at one point you said to me, let me see if I can find it. You said, overall, this is very good, but you are, are conflating the, as you put it, Rome and medieval Europe, and you said, unstick that collage. You tend to generalize about literature. And I wrote back to you and I said, you're right, Mila, you're always right. I've ignored the distinctions between medieval and classical. I, am, I was working from assumptions I'd made. I, I'm, I too readily generalize. And then I went on to say, but, Allow me a little more space for indulgent generalizations. And it was that kind of rapport that we that you allowed us to have. You know, you were you were so instructive. You're leading us to helping us learn, but always inviting a, a pushback. And, and uh, you know, that has I know for many people who are who are listening now um, has been a, a really um, lifelong uh, important inspiration. Yeah, uh, ditto. <laughs> it's, it's all true. Um, I think that that uh, semester in Rome was for me uh, one of the greatest experiences of my life. Uh, I had, of course, unlike you, uh, worked with Mila uh, prior to that, but this was very different uh, because it was it felt like it was the whole package. It wasn't just classes. It was uh, the experience of living there and uh, speaking that language a little bit um, and going to these places and uh, reading, you know, Shakespeare in the Forum. Uh, uh, I just interject to say I had forgotten about that. Uh, when we were we were studying Shakespeare in Italy and we were going to the Roman Forum and Jim, when we were in the Roman Forum, pulled out his tiny little volume of Julius Caesar and began to read Mark Antony's speech on the death of Caesar in the Roman Forum and an entire big crowd of visiting tourists gathered around as Jim stood on a little rock. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you could, once you did that, Millie, you cast us in different roles and I was actually cast as the rabble. And so, you know, Jim would say, my fellow Again. countrymen, I'm, yo, yay, yay. <laughs> and then you would respond, right? <laughs> yes. But, but because of that, I've taught it in Rome two times, uh, two or three times after that. My students now put on performances of Shakespeare. I wanted them to do it in the Roman Forum, but unfortunately it closes yeah, at five o'clock and they had to do it yeah. at night. And it's but way all because of you, Jim, all because of you. <laughs> well, well it's, it's my recollection that I was enjoined uh, by you to well, uh, do that reading. Yeah. I, I did do it spontaneously yeah. as much as I loved it. I think uh, it was <laughs> it was closed because we went off to play Frisbee in the forum oh. and, and we uh, that's sent the Frisbee sort that, of that's why reeling toward uh, a, an innocent Italian woman's head and that was. Uh, and, and that <laughs> night um, I made dinner for Joanna and a few other people in my apartment and I didn't live uh, where the school was uh, on the Aventine Hill. Uh, but in Trastevere, across the river, oh, I didn't and we that. all got really drunk. Can you really? say? Can you say drunk? No, on? Our kids well, well no. <laughs> we, we all got really uh, happy. Happy. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, 
and then realized uh, that we had locked ourselves out of the apartment and there was no rousing uh, Peggy, the proprietress. And so I scaled this unbelievably enormous high tiled roof. I, I must have been trying to impress you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the girl with the green And jumped <laughs> down and broke my foot. And, yeah. Um, yeah, but, but unlock the door. Yeah, actually. yeah. I yeah. did do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, those are great memories. But now talk a little bit about you all, about your getting together, how you got together, when you finally did, and your careers that have really resulted from all this. That's what. Well, you know, it was in Rome. With I, You might recall, Mella, that I had left <laughs> Trinity uh, just in, in my sophomore year after the uh, first semester sophomore year. Just to, I wanted to be in New York City. And I went there and studied at Barnard for a year. That's why um, the department didn't know you. Yeah, and then I then I took a semester off, and then I went to uh, Rome. So I've been away from Trinity for a long time, but I'd heard about this Jim Long and Bach, and I'd heard about this Professor Riggio, and I thought, okay. In fact, it was Hugh Ogden. I see someone has uh, uh, referred to him um, fondly. Uh, did great influence, again, on, on both of us. Uh, Hugh had said, you have to go study with Mila. And while you're there, keep your eyes open for a, someone named Jim Longenbach. And so I kept my eyes open uh, and we met in that small group, you know, pretty, pretty early on. And I, I actually remember vividly when we um, started to sh share work, um, Jim was writing poems. And, and in fact, <laughs> it didn't even occur to me those poems were about me. I mean. There, there are a lot of people with green eyes. So. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, I was writing stories. And uh, I, I, at one evening in that apartment in Trastevere, uh, we sat across from each other, reading each other's work for the first time in, in depth. And I remember how, you know, exciting it was, but fearful I felt uh, to, to, to share work and, and feel you know, so um, intent on 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 a rapport and communication. So so but that's we began really as reading each other's work early on and have continued to do that for 40, 40 years. years more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, that has become, I mean, it's in a way a, a, a kind of deep collaboration, I think. And and our lives, we we do our, um, you know, we we write partial, sputtering drafts and and then uh, try them out and and together we share ideas and comments and and try to make something stronger out of that that collaboration. But it all began in in Rome. There, in fact, the I, I think the first day we met was when we'd taken a little walking tour mm -hmm. and that woman had dropped her- To the Largo Argentine. And the woman dropped her pocketbook and yeah. I went over to help her pick it up. And she dropped a little bag of groceries and these oranges spilled. Right, right. And you collected the oranges. Right. And, and all the other students had walked on, but Jim waited for me. <laughs> so that's when we started to- Jim waited for you <laughs> because he was like, <laughs> okay <laughs> then some some of the wonderful people on this in our zoom room will know the story that many years later uh two other young students arrived <laughs> in rome at uh on the rome summer program at the barbieri center and one happened to be our daughter and uh, another happened to be Mark Di Benedetto, who I was, Catherine and Mark had never met. And they went off on a walking tour with the group. <laughs> and what, that was about 10 mm, years ago. And they're, they're engaged to be married. So, <laughs> so and, there, and Mark was also a student of mine. That's yeah. right. Yeah, sure. That's okay. right. You're one of the most beloved teachers. Is, you know, <laughs> there's so many people in the world that, that can say that. We we feel it, it's a just it's a wonderful club to be in. The people who got to study with Mila Riggio. So yeah. Okay, oh. Jim, what do you want to contribute? Well <laughs> again, uh, all of that and more. Uh, I remember um, you know, 
<laughs> almost immediately because of those oranges uh, uh, being uh, completely besotted. And um, I wrote uh, maybe my first pentameter, she has green eyes and wears a hood that hides <laughs> them um, <laughs> in a poem. But I, you know, I understand uh, how it wasn't clear that those poems were about you, even though they were nothing but that, because I was both immediately very in love, but I was also very shy or very decorous and it was really important to me that we read each other mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and know each other mm -hmm. uh and uh i guess i didn't take that lightly and sometimes it, it was a little painful i suppose mm -hmm. um uh, but i'm glad of that yeah uh, in retrospect and i'm uh, because as you have suggested, beginning in Rome, we began this, it began as a ritual of, of sharing work, uh, but that has continued voluminously. And we got over the anxiety of what the other person would say, or the anxiety of the other person saying, this isn't any good, or mm -hmm. this is really good right mm -hmm. here. And you have to get rid of all of this. You know, by the time we were 21, we were done with any problems mm -hmm. uh, with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I always felt, uh, because of this time in Rome, uh, that I had a reader uh, that was completely transparent mm -hmm. and that I could go to uh, without needing to worry about any repercussions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's that's been a really wonderful career for both of you. And I think just you have a very rare and unusual relationship. And I, I feel privileged to have watched it start. But I do remember that you each had a boyfriend and a girlfriend other than each other. You go off and spend a little time with them at the end of the semester, as I recall, before you came back together again. Yeah, there, there were a few accoutrements that needed to be just A few things you had to resolve. Uh, but so when did you actually finally get married uh, in relationship to your two careers? I couldn't recall that exactly. Well, we finally got married like 600 years later. <laughs> <laughs> but by, by the, the mayor that, of Princeton. <laughs> by the mayor of Princeton. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but by that uh, October, uh, it you was completely yes, no, you were back together again no I, I remembered that and then Joanna still had her and you had your degree at Princeton and she had hers at Brown and you had things to do uh, I've switched my background as you may notice from Rome to Trinity so that is a signal that I'd like to switch the conversation a little bit and have you talk about your own work a little bit now and I had a couple of ideas but I want to kind of leave you as Joanna said I like to do quite a lot of space. So I have one topic I want to introduce, but I don't want you to be limited by it at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I do want to, um, I do want to sort of, what I'd like to focus on is in both of your work, the relationship between history, research, life, fact, truth, and your own concept of the artistic imagination. Uh, and I want to fill in the context of that a little bit. I, I had particular, and in Jim's case, I'd also like Jim to talk about the relationship between being a scholar and a poet. How do the, because they're all part of one life experience. How do those things reinforce each other if they do it all? And how do they bear on this question of history and truth, given the fact that, you know, you are one who wrote about that in your modernist poetics book a long time ago. The, I think I want to contextualize this just a little tiny bit more, because I think it's a question that's, uh, that's very important for us right now, given the fact that we've all been living in four years worth of false facts, of fake news, of false truth. What does it mean to talk about a truth that isn't factual or isn't historical, uh, but is imaginative and artistic? 
and based on research, because you both do enormous amounts of research, <laughs> Jim for his scholarly books, Joanna just for her novels. Uh, uh, you know, in the conversations with Joanna Scott book, Joanna, uh, Michael Lackey focuses a lot on, in his introduction, on your definition of biographical fiction mm -hmm. and on your sense of artistic truth, which mm -hmm. is really fairly close, I think, to Werner Herzog's notion of ecstatic truth, mm -hmm. which is a truth that really belongs to the artist. So you don't feel kind of encumbered by the history you've researched to mm -hmm. try to create a biographical document. And Jim would help you justify that with his knowledge of the 19th and early 20th century and the sort of notion of the beginnings of this concept of factual authentic, which is a word that I think we can call into question quite a bit truth. So if you could talk about that a little bit, that would be great. Uh, sure, sure. I, I, I'll just start say something very quickly and then um, I, I leave it to you. Well, well two things. It, um, uh, I saw today that uh, our, our soon to be former Governor Cuomo <laughs> wrote that uh, or said that uh, the, he, he didn't think he'd cross the line and hadn't realized that the lines had been redrawn. And I want to that, that those lines are constantly evolving, being redrawn. And that and one of those lines is, is separates uh, fiction from history. Uh, it, it is it is ever changing, so uh, that's important to say right at right at the start. There's you know I don't have any fixed idea about where where that line is, and I think in response to uh, 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 dangerous um, uh, uh, the the fake news, the the uh, disguising of of. Uh, fact or the dis disguising of fiction as truth that that's something that then is changing the line and, and making me eager to respond in different ways so so there's that and we can talk uh, more about that but then the other thing I'll say is is Jim's early um, uh, uh, his first book his first explorations coming out of well during uh, his, his graduate studies um, about the modernist poetics of history really engage this question. And, and I think it's, it's taken me a while to understand how fundamental that uh, that was in my, my own work, your, for your, your couple of years immersion in these studies got me thinking at a very young age about the, uh, the flexibilities and consistencies of historical writing and, and of, of ways of thinking about it that uh, to me were, were new. So that, that became, um, I think, really important to me as a young writer. Uh, even it, it, my very first novel, you mentioned, Mel, about the fishermen. I have to, one correction I'll say is it wasn't my father who loved fishing. He loved martinis. He did oh. not <laughs> love fishing. But, uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was Jim's grandfather. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, thank you. Was, I had a feeling I had that wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I was drawing early on. That I sort of found I was able once I, I stopped trying to write uh, about myself, really, that and and write about someone as different as uh, as <laughs> or, or or the world of Jim's grandparents, which was um, uh, deep inside the Pennsylvania a Dutch community. Uh, I, I just started to, to think about uh, creating some kind of almost historical narrative out of, out of something that, that was other, different, a story that hadn't been saved and preserved in history. Uh, and, and with Jim's own scholarship in mind, I think, as, as I embarked on that, and, and then in uh, subsequent books got closer and closer to history, even as that line kept shifting. So, well, with arrogance in particular, of course, when you yes, I, I, that yes. that was that was the one that that kind of turned me. So, you why know, don't you tell people who haven't read arrogance what it's about, when it was written, and and explain how it relates to this question? Because we don't want to be just talking. Yeah, about yeah. It. So, so this is <laughs> arrogance is my third novel, and uh, it's. Uh, main character at center is an artist named Egon Schele, an Austrian artist who worked in the Fende Siecla Austrian uh, culture and, and uh, was, was uh, quite a 
magnificent artist died very young at the age of, of 28. And I uh, create a, a somewhat fragmented um, or collage narrative uh, around the facts of his life. And, and, and the one thing I did without, like I didn't question doing it at that point. I used his name. I called him Egon. I, I, I used the names of historical characters in that. Uh, and so, you know, I, I guess I felt, I, w I was no expert in Fendesiecla Vienna. Uh, not at that point, not much was known about Sheila. M much more has, has been published in uh, recent decades. But um, I, I felt, and, and I, we think back on our work with you, Milan, and your, uh, the, 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 the attention to, to theater and performance, I, I thought of the, the fiction as, as theater and, and in theater, one puts on a mask and, and, and can do that freely. And no one ever thinks if, 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 you know, if I go on stage with a mask of, of Richard Nixon covering my face, no one's going to think I'm Richard Nixon. And so <laughs> that's the way I approach the novel arrogance. No one's going to think I'm Aegon Sheila. Uh, this, this is what I'm doing is, thinking about Aegon Sheila. What I'm doing is thinking about the history, trying to imagine stories that haven't been told, trying to imagine in the stories that have been told, things that have been left out. Uh, so that, that uh, the, with that novel, and it, it did become important to use the name. That, that gave me some kind of a, a, a foundation or a framework. Um, and then that, that in some ways has continued to work with that framework um, in, in uh, many novels and stories. Since right, then. right. Even, and you then in this latest set of short stories, you write a lot about what it means to tell the story and whose story it is and from what perspective. And your example of, uh, of Governor Cuomo today is a very good example, you know. <laughs> what he was doing then is not what he could do now and he's going to resign now for what he was doing then and he says the rules have changed right yeah. and so that yeah. means that reality has in some sense yeah. changed yeah. for him but he's yeah. going to be punished now for the reality that he had to did not didn't was not aware of then right, right. so right. that's a, a really important question and you know one of the reasons that this question occurred to me and I said this to Jim and Joanna before we started they haven't seen the movie I haven't seen it in the movie and so it's probably not even worth bringing this movie up but right now at Cine Studio there is this film uh, a Neville Morgan's film Roadrunner Morgan is a favorite filmmaker of mine because he also directed uh so 30 feet from stardom and other really I think important films in which he created he generated computer generated 90 seconds of Anthony Bourdain's voice this film is about Anthony Bourdain and his suicide right and he created a voice with which Anthony Bourdain reads a 90 second despairing email that he wrote to a friend before he killed himself and as interesting as the film apparently is, what's really created the firestorm is this question about the truth or the fake truth or the false truth of this computer generated voice, which is really such an oddly uh, interesting question about this whole nature of truth and reality and what is true. Bourdain wrote the email his voice reads the email, but he in life never actually read it. That has prompted a, uh, uh, a Helen Rosner uh, essay in this week's New Yorker magazine about the fake voice, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. deep fake Anthony Bourdain voice as inauthentic and unhistorical. So Jim, kind of coming to you in terms of this question of the relationship between truth and history, tell us what the late, what your work on the late 19th and early 20th century taught you and how it led you to question that idea that factual history, positivist history is yes. somehow the only guide to truth. Yes. Um, well, let, let me, uh, I want to get to exactly that question. Uh, but just take a very short detour uh, to 
say that when I went to graduate school immediately after Rome, unlike Joanna, I went to a program that was exclusively uh, literary critical, uh, though it was important that you mm -hmm. uh, did a creative program and I learned a great deal from that. It was also important to me at the time to do that. I never ceased to think of myself as a poet and I never uh, ceased to feel that making sentences was making sentences. I've never felt any tension between literary criticism and poetry. And I frankly don't understand why people think there could be one. <laughs> uh, most great poets were great literary critics. In fact, all great poets are great literary critics. A lot of them just don't happen to write it down. Uh, you, you have to read like a hundred great poems to write a halfway decent one. Um, uh, um, so really because of the work that I'd done with Mila, uh, I was uh, intent, perhaps even somewhat taking for granted the, uh, the fact that uh, to read a work of literature was to read it in its in some kind of historical situatedness. Uh, but when I went to graduate school in the early 80s, history was really out. <laughs> it was not fashionable. Uh, it became very fashionable mm. <laughs> uh, in uh, you know 10, 12 years. But then at the height of deconstruction and so on, it was you know, really old fashioned stuff. And it was uh, because of the collision of that with the work I'd done at Trinity uh, that made me want to know about the history of how we have thought about historical knowledge. And uh, what I discovered is that uh, exactly what you're saying, um, that the the bogeyman of history is very often this, you know, moribund, positivistic notion of truth. And you can't do that with historical thinking. There's, there's no object, there's no thing there. There's no refrigerator standing right there uh, to be measured against what you're saying. I just happen to have Charlemagne right here. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, and, uh, there are many uh, great thinkers in the 19th century uh, who thought about uh, historical knowledge as a coherence with the present and not a correspondence with the object because there is no object. Right. <laughs> Charlemagne's dead. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, that developed into a project that was influential really on everything uh, that I've done. That was your modernist history of po history of modernist poetics. Um, modern modernist book. poetics of history, yes. Yeah, modernist poetics of history. I and you know, that began as my history. Yeah, you know, even with regard to somebody like Shakespeare, I often say to my students that if we airlifted a production of a Shakespeare play to us right now, it would not be authentic because the audience would change. And because so much of drama is in the interaction between the audience and the play, it would be the worst piece of museum theater that anybody had ever seen because it would have no living identity in the immediate moment. And, and what you're saying is that that is what gives history its meaning. Now, yes, how, does that, how does that influence your work? That is, does it influence your work, that knowledge? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it's influenced my work and a, and a lot of greater people's work. I, I think immediately of the the great plays that uh, uh, Yeats wrote in the 1920s, where all the actors are masked, and though they're different people, they speak identically. Uh, so that your conventional notions of character and characterization and plot are gone <laughs> and uh, you have to think in other ways uh, to make sense of this material. Uh, today, uh, there are many poets still uh, working in uh, ways that similarly diffuse uh, 
our knowledge of what we think or imagine is stable. And don't get upset about that. Say, what's for lunch? <laughs> uh, it's I'm not going to ask you that question. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's just the way it is. Ho oh, hum. <laughs> Joanna, do you want to say just a little bit more about well, this? Well, I do. Sure. You know, to, what's different now is that we have a technology <clears throat> that is uh, presenting a kind of disguise that we've never had before. And so that might then change the our, our thinking about disguise and, and masking. masking. Because if if for political purposes or uh, some you know nefarious purposes uh, for, for slanderous reasons or something you know a, a, a deep fake video uh, convinces an audience that it is true that it is real that it is is factual that that's we've entered dangerous territory and we have entered that that territory so then what's the role of the artist well the I would say then we we just need it, or the educator who's probably share this responsibility to uh, just uh, make people <clears throat> as um, skeptical and, and uh, perceptive as they possibly can be in discerning the, the differences between uh, the, 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 the theater and the deep fake, you know, the, to, to recognize this, this clever, clever disguise. Um, but then, you know, I, I, I find myself as a, a writer, what this does is push me to be, you know, as, as transparent as I possibly can be mm -hmm. uh, to, to say, you know, this isn't, this isn't egg on Sheila. This is, this is my egg on Sheila. This isn't um, the, uh, you know, I, I'm not out to present an, an accurate historical account of any of the subjects I've treated and, and, uh, fiction um i'm i'm out to to present a, a theatrical account of a, 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 a dramatic account um and 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 so to really really make that clear make that transparent uh, i feel is is uh, essential now except the i think that's true but the only thing i would add is that there's no other way there is no Egon Sheila. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. You know, right. your convincing egg on Sheila becomes the truth. Well, this see, you haven't had to deal with this. Once in a while, I get, yeah, I, I, I'm often um, uh, diving into the past, but sometimes the past is a little bit more recent. And once in a while, <laughs> the past pops up his head and says, here I am in the form of a relative uh, of a character <laughs> I've written about. <laughs> and that I get like, uh-oh, uh-oh. So there... far it's been okay, but I like, uh-oh, I, I better be careful here. There is, uh, very briefly, I referred to these earlier today when we were talking about this issue. Um, the novelist Ford Maddox Ford in the 1920s wrote uh, this beautiful preface about exactly that issue when he was writing a trilogy of novels about the Wazir Henry VIII, nobody cared. <laughs> but when he was writing novels about the First World War that everybody remembered intimately, yes, yes. people cared a lot. Oh. Um, and oh. it made him think hard about the difference of between writing about yesterday and writing about the 16th century. Right, uh, um, which is what Joanna is talking about too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no. And now I think the question is more complicated by the fact that we have to deal with a world in which uh, really false information is being put forward as true. And that's a completely different kind of mask from the mask you're, the artist wears when the artist creates a world of imagination that is grounded in some sense of reality, but it's isn't completely it completely No. Okay. <laughs> so talk a little bit about that. 
<laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if I have more to say. Do you? <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. It's true. I, I, I'm a little bit. If, bit if it were completely different, it wouldn't be so interesting. <laughs> or so frightening. Yeah. Are so frightening. So, um, so I think well, I will. I will confess. Only here. Don't let this out of our virtual room, everyone. But <laughs> I've dabbled a little bit, just as I do with biography, with memoir recently. And this is going to be something that only arrives on the scene posthumously. It's not <laughs> going to be, you know, ever published during my life. But I do treat uh, my. Or, or a version, an imaginative version of my youth and Trinity and Rome and a, a special and me. Tea, and me, <laughs> who's called JV, and a special teacher uh, who taught us in Rome, who I refer to as the goddess Minerva. <laughs> <laughs> and guess who that is? So one day, there, there's, there's gonna be, one day I'm uh, right. and you're in it and you're called the goddess Minerva. The only everybody here knows that, and that's a big secret. So don't <laughs> go out. Don't, don't let it out, folks. <laughs> uh, so far, we don't have any questions in the question and answer session, except one student who asked me why I had forgotten about my Anglo-Saxon past. And so <laughs> I oh. say for the record that I did my doctoral dissertation in Anglo-Saxon poetry, and the first course I taught at Trinity most emphatically was not Shakespeare, but Anglo-Saxon. And we used to do Anglo-Saxon meals at the end of the course every semester. And um, and there you go. And I, I didn't mention it. So now- oh, and. and Ich bin mir still from South Reckon. Oh my god. 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 Oh my the Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my the Oh my god. Oh my god. I my god. Oh my with me. With me. So Jim was actually one of my Anglo-Saxon students, and we used to do this end of the semester thing in which we would have a mead hall meal, <laughs> right? And everybody would have to dress up in something like mead hall clothes and give their final papers at St. Anthony's Hall or someplace at Trinity. <laughs> right? So that even then there was a little bit of drama attached to it. But yes, Anglo-Saxon was my first love. So there I have now gotten it out and it's there. And now we would like some other questions, preferably for Jim and Joanna <laughs> in the question and answer session. But I have one more question that I want to ask Ask you all first. And that is, Jim has been, uh, he doesn't like the word battling. He thinks it's too dramatic a word for uh, over trying to overcome illness. But Jim has been dealing with very serious uh, health issues for the last few years, uh, potentially life threatening ones. You look great, by the way. I would never know that. Uh, but I just wondered, and Joanna has been very much a part of that struggle. So since this is really one of the things I like to tell my students is there's, there's no such thing as the real world out there. You're in it. Wherever you are, you're in it. You bring your real world with you. The classroom is the real world. Get over this notion that it's not. And if you don't carry your classroom with you, you haven't really learned anything anyway. So because I believe in the integration of life and learning, uh, I'd also like to ask you how the experiences of your lives, any of them you want to talk about, but this rather uh, difficult um, set of experiences you've gone through in the last few years, how has that affected your work? I sense it in Forever, which I bought and read and loved, uh, and so I see it in the poetry, but could you, com could you comment a little bit on what it means to have to integrate that awareness into your uh, professional work? Sure. I, I don't mind saying at all that uh, for the last uh, five and a half years, I've had kidney cancer and I've had two very serious surgeries. And this is not the kind of cancer that will ever be cured. Uh, and so I am constantly in treatment and the treatments change because they stop working eventually. Your DNA finds a way around it. Um, and some things that work great for one person don't work at all for the next person, and we don't know why. Um, I don't. I don't like those metaphors that we use of battling cancer or fighting cancer because, like, battling what or fighting what? I just sit in a chair and they pour poison into me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even have any choices. <laughs> I don't do anything. I just sit 
uh, and watch the IV. Uh, um, uh, so, and, and fortunately, somebody pays the, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month uh, that this costs. Well, we're lucky to be employed. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I, I, I guess I'd add that what uh, one of the things we didn't understand about cancer was that it could be uh, viewed as a chronic disease. You know, metastatic yes. cancer, you think, oh. It's, it's a catastrophic diagnosis. It's not anymore. It is absolutely not anymore. Of course, it depends on different growth rates and different cancers, but uh, wow, they, they, they are able to uh, manage this disease, uh, maybe not eradicate it, but, but manage it for years and decades. So it, it becomes a chronic disease and you just have to think about that. And it does you know the world in a way, the world hasn't caught up. The, the metaphors haven't changed, you know there's there's the war on cancel, the battle, the, I, I, you see some, sometimes in the media, it, it, uh, it, it's too easily the, the thing cited as, as uh, the, the big catastrophe. We're, we're but, the big strong bill. <laughs> big stuff. <laughs> A very big bill, especially uh -huh. in this country. No question yeah. about that. Yeah. Forget that telephone ring. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, to those who, anybody out there who actually has, has had to deal with this, you know too, that the... Um, it is a whole new world out there, and, uh, and it's we changing all the time. Live, you know, there are many chronic diseases, and 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 this is uh, one of them. So yeah, I, I I think it's fair to say that for both of us, uh, this experience has made us rethink the issue of mortality uh, from the ground up, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think that has been important for, for both of us and for our writing uh, and for our thinking and feeling. Mm -hmm. For our family. I mean, yeah. we, we've for, done things like- For all of us. Uh, planted ourselves in Stonington, Connecticut near the sea because- It's beautiful. We want to. <laughs> you yeah. know, we never did anything. We like really <laughs> wanted to uh, without being sort of, you know, uh, serious and and, and dedicated to our, our work and responsible citizens, but this was yeah. in some ways a, a bit of a, a folly in, in, in the, the happy sense, uh, yeah. you know, there's- it, it also makes one, you know, say things like, what pandemic? You, you know, <laughs> it's already inside you? Mm. It's going to kill you? Yeah. yeah. Right. But then well, you have managed, you have managed to do your work and to carry on. So with your typical attitude, the what what's for lunch in the middle of any big question moment attitude, the typical practical way of being Jim the Joker, you have managed this disease to allow your lives to continue. But mentioning being in Stonington reminds me of, uh, brings me to one question that we do have from Philip Grabfield, which is he wants to ask about the influence of being in Hartford and Darien for Joanna on your writing. Mm -hmm. So if you can talk about that a little bit, that would be, uh, and then there's one other question that uh, that I will ask. We only have about 10 minutes maximum now left, so folks. So if you have a question, get it to us quickly. And mm -hmm. Jim and mm -hmm. Joanna, you can talk about this. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to talk about Hartford? No, we'll talk about good. Darien. You go ahead. Talk about it. Uh, uh, so I grew up in Darien, Connecticut, in Fairfield County. Uh, and um, at the time, uh, I reflect back on it and my, my childhood impressions of it were, were quite different from what I see now. I, 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 I uh, see both better and, and worse there, there now. Um, it, it was in some ways a, a supportive community, but um, some of the exclusions uh, were actually affected our family because in ways our family didn't really Fit in there. Uh, it was the the uh, kind of unusual back then, and that my parents early on got divorced. Uh, my mother was a single mother supporting the family. Uh, she worked as a school psychologist in the Stanford school systems, so uh, that that didn't exactly fit the the Darien profile. Um, 
I was a little snot of a kid and I thought, you know, I, I was angry at this you know the the you know I couldn't go to the Darien sports shop and buy my sweater but uh that uh it took me a while to grow out of uh but that did give me I think a a, a feeling of a and, and perhaps falsely so and and outsider status a little, a, a little bit and yet I have dear friends still from from there one of the things I did there early on was um in a sense it saved my life it's there I uh, it I uh, there was a, a ambulance run by a volunteer ambulance run by high school students and I joined it I became an emergency medical technician i uh, volunteered very frequently in the emergency department at Norwalk Hospital. Uh, so between the ages of 15 and 18, it was like I was living in war. I, 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 the things I saw then, uh, it, it changed me utterly. And I had to grow up very fast as, as everyone else did who, who was um, part of this program. Um, we had to learn to be absolutely cool in the face of the the worst accidents on i-95 or uh devastating trauma uh, or, or 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 sudden illness um just cool and that was so hard when you're 16 years old um so that that was you know i've, I, I've never successfully written about that uh, in in my fiction but I think about it still, and I, I feel it was uh, uh, somehow, you know, formed me as a as a writer. Back back in my high school days, I did try to write uh, stories about. It. In fact, I think the very first story I published it was in the, the Darien Literary Magazine. I, I had I uh, I was writing a story about. Uh, uh, someone I'd seen in the or various events in the emergency room at, at Norwalk Hospital. And because I was writing it when I was 16 years old, I began with lots of adjectives and a raging storm and, and you know, really overwrought. And I, <laughs> someone got a hold, in fact, it was an adult supervisor at this uh, volunteer ambulance, he got a hold of my notebook that I'd written the story in, and he started to read it aloud, laughing to the whole group. Uh, they like, listen to this funny story. And I thought, oh, wow, that's really bad. He was reading my own words back to me. I thought, hmm, that's really bad. <laughs> so I went back and I made it a little better. And that was the first story I think I published in the, uh, you know, uh, the high school literary magazine. So anyway, that, that I haven't really much treated in, in fiction uh, over the years, but uh, that was a very important part of my life in Darien. That's very good. Jim, I, I want you to do this in about 30 seconds because I've noticed now that most of the questions are in the chat and not in the Q&A. And there are a couple of them I want to get to. So tell us about Hartford in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> oh, God. It's pressure. Well, I remember vividly in 19, the fall of 1977, the minimalist artist Carl Andre installing stone field in hartford which is a sequence of boulders and i thought then and i think now it's very beautiful and i've actually in the last about a little about seven years ago i wrote a poem about it but it, it comes out of that recollection right. i used to walk downtown often by myself uh on a friday afternoon and i remember seeing that uh, sculpture in particular. That's very interesting. And in fact, I remember when I returned from Rome thinking how much I was going to hate Hartford and driving through it and thinking, oh my God, it's beautiful. It had never occurred to me that Bushnell Park was beautiful. It had never occurred to me wow. that there was any beauty wow. in Hartford until well, Rome. Wallace Stevens thought Bushnell right. Park was beautiful. Yes, well, he and Wallace Stevens was right. And of course, you <laughs> write about Wallace Stevens. So, um, uh, Richard C. would like to know, right? Hey, Rich. 
if you remember how I arranged for us all to go to the opera, of course, I had that course on Shakespeare operas, we have to say. It was one of the three courses you were taking. But he said how Mella even arranged for all of us to experience over four hours of opera in Italian. He said it La Scala, but it was really the Rome Opera House. Cosi Fantuti, as a 20-year-old, how we tried to relate to what we were seeing on stage in the traditional costumes, how our search for truth was so different when we were that age. So do you have anything to say about the change in the search for truth over the last 40 years? Right? Well, I, I remember that evening I, I go to the Opera in Rome. I, I'm a little bit different. By that point, I had seen many operas. Uh, so I was used to that. It, the production seemed to me a little bit old fashioned um, because uh, um, I guess it was. Uh, but it was beautifully sung. Uh, um, I didn't know the plot and I don't know now, but I've heard the opera. <laughs> we sat outside trying to get tickets and we thought we had to go early uh, because we thought it was going to be sold out. And we got there at five o'clock in the morning with blankets and everything. And nobody else came till 10 a.m. We cheered when the second group of people arrived, but we got our tickets. <laughs> I, mean, I remember we saw Macbeth in Italian, a, 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 the stage play in, in Italian. Oh, yes. And remember the uh, in the ripped untimely from his mother's womb, they unzipped. Uh, was it a <laughs> belt term? Oh, I thought it was a. <laughs> so we went around the next week or so unzipping whatever we and had. The, the witches did crawl about very evocatively, I thought in a plexiglass stage underneath the plexiglass mm. Mm. Yes, and they were always there. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was very nice. Yes, we did do that. Uh, and there are a bunch of questions in the chat. I hope we have access at, to after this, uh, Steve can tell us after this is over so that we can respond to them in writing. But I wanna ask one last question by Linda D. Benedetto. <laughs> <laughs> So Linda has been saved for last. Uh, Joanna, are there more novels? Jim, more poetry. Will you be writing a poem for Catherine and Mark's wedding? How lucky are the Benedettos to marry into such a wicked, smart family? <laughs> wicked smart. <laughs> Linda is one of my favorite people in the world. Um, and as it happens, um, writing a marriage poem is one of the oldest forms in Western culture. And I've never written one, but I have written a little one about uh, Catherine and Mark. And if I'm feeling very brave, uh, maybe I'll do it at the reception. Yeah, and there there might be more poems still to, to come. So um, the uh, uh, thank you. Linda and, and, and Tom, that is uh, uh, wonderful to, you know, <laughs> gather in this way and, and, and think, have shared memories of, of Trinity. Is the wedding? And, is it coming yeah. soon? Yeah, the what? The wedding is in uh, next June, actually. Okay, well, good luck. But there happens to be a bachelorette party coming up in it very soon so <laughs> i have more. to say that that mark videotaped one of the shakespeare performance evenings when he was taking my shakespeare class his contribution as a filmmaker which he is mm -hmm. or was at least for a time yeah. and yeah. Yeah. no it continues to do that yeah. wonderful film on squash yeah. at trinity uh but he also videotaped the, what I called the playing game performances one night. So we had a Mark D. Benedetto film of our performances, which I was always very- Oh, proud. that's wonderful. I think I had several of the D. Benedetto boys, but Mark is the one- I <laughs> there are a lot of them. Most, <laughs> a most clearly. Okay, folks, uh, we don't have time for any more questions. We've reached our witching hour. Uh, and, and I want to say a heartfelt thanks to Jim and Joanna. This has been a wonderful experience for me. Yes. I hope it has been good for you all. And I hope good for those who were listening. And I hope that we can get to your comments in the chat once this meeting is closed. Steve can um, tell me whether we can. And if we can't, then we will just say goodbye to everybody but we will not actually end the meeting or we'll ask Steve to leave it open so that you can see these chat comments. Because that, that, uh, I just, just to add, Mila, there are, uh, you know, so many 
warm memories of, of, of you and, and your, your teaching and uh, share it in the chat. So I hope you've had. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I must say I have not had time to look. Okay. All right. yeah, I started yeah, looking for Q and A's, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's a wonderful world to remember all together. And what we have to remember is how much we give each other, all of those watching us, you and Jim to each other, you have an amazing marriage, but all of us interactively to each other. This is, for my purposes, what makes life worthwhile. The rest of it is all fluff, but this <laughs> yeah. really matters. Let's, so thank let's you. preserve those words, Mila. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. All, and thank all you our friends here and everybody, everybody who came to share this evening with us. We could go on all night, but we are <laughs> sure. right now, yeah. right? So thank you. Thank you all very right. much. Thank you. Thank